Okay, um, in this video we're going to cover 8.3, which is again confidence intervals, but this time for proportions. And just to remind you, remember a proportion is something we've been talking about all along. Say in California, 70% um, um, of voters are registered as Democrat. Well, that's a proportion just written in the form of percent. You could write it as a decimal. That's a proportion just written in the form of a decimal. Or 70 out of 100, or 7 over 10 is also the proportion of uh, Democrat voters in California. So um, in this case, we are going to be trying to estimate some sort of population proportion. So our population distribution, again, who knows what it looks like. But there is some proportion, right? There's some true proportion of registered voters that are Democrat, or, or whatever the heck the example might be. Um, we're always going to take a sample, giving us a sample proportion, which remember we represent as p hat. And just like we did with means, around that sample proportion, we're going to build a window. We're going to add some standard deviations to the right, subtract some to the left, creating a confidence interval. And based on how confident we want to be, that's going to determine how many standard deviations we go left and right, um, therefore how wide the window is and essentially how likely we are to scoop up the actual parameter that we're interested in. Right? So our point estimate is always going to be p hat, the sample proportion, and we're going to try and use that to get a hold of the population proportion. Um, if you made it through the 8.1 and 8.2 videos, this is going to be a lot smoother because it's identical, um, and we're not going to go into as much detail, and you'll see a ton of similarity. Um, really all that changes is how we calculate the standard deviation when we're talking about proportions. So just to remind you, the general form of a confidence interval hasn't changed. You start with your test statistic, right? your point estimate, which in our case dealing with a proportion would be the sample proportion. And then you are going to add, remember what this is what we've come to know as our margin of error. The critical value, which is how many standard deviations, you're going to add or subtract. Okay, so this is our margin of error. So the formula is again my point estimate. You start there, and then you add or subtract a bunch of standard deviations and this is how many of them you add or subtract. Now remember, this comes as a result of the central limit theorem in 7.1. Remember, that theorem tells us that when you sample and you get a bunch of sample proportions, that as long as the conditions are met, that those are going to be nice and normal and bell-shaped, and the mean of the sample proportions will be the same as the actual proportion for the population and the standard deviation of those sample proportions is found using this formula. Oops, that should be an egg. So the only thing that's different here is that we have a different formula for finding standard deviation, okay, as when compared to the mean. Otherwise, the way we construct a confidence interval is 100% the same. Okay, so here they're just kind of reminding us what a sample proportion is. It's what we learned is probability, right? It's the number of successes over the sample size. Um, Z star, this guy is our critical number. It tells us how many standard deviations we're adding. They use this Z sub alpha over 2. Again, remember the idea is if you're cutting off a certain percentage, like say I want to be 90% confident, that leaves 5% in each of these, because the whole thing has to add up to 100%. Um, and so if your confidence level is 90, alpha would be considered the rest, which would be 10%. Half of alpha is what I'm interested in as far as the z-score is concerned. That's what I'm going to read off my z-table. So that's why you often see it expressed as z sub alpha over 2.
They're saying take the remaining area, the 10%, and cut it in half and find the z-score that uh, makes that cutoff. And we just kind of recapped here that um, the standard deviation for the distribution of sample proportions is given by this formula. It's not like it was with the means, which was this, right? That was for the mean. For proportions, this is what we're talking about. Um, this is also sometimes referred to as the standard error, not the margin of error, the standard error. Okay. Um, if you recall, there were five steps for creating a confidence interval um, that we learned in 8.1 and 8.2, and we have the exact same five steps here. So just to remind us, one of the things we had to do was check IRL. Our, is our data independently sampled, random, and large enough? Okay. Well, for the independent, again, a lot of the times we're just going to rely on the 5% rule. We're not going to really split hairs over it. Most of the data we collect will be very small compared to the whole population. And so whether or not the data is truly independent, the 5% rule is going to work for us. Uh, we do hope that our data was selected randomly to avoid bias. And this is slightly different than the mean. Remember, also by the central limit theorem, in order to be large enough, in order for your p hat distribution to be normal, we needed the number of successes and the number of fails to be at least 10. And so if you remember from 7.1, the number of successes was found by taking n times p, and the number of fails was found by taking n times q. And we need both of those to be greater than or equal to 10. Remember, for means, this requirement was that we had a sample size of at least 30. For proportions, it's different. This is it. Number of successes and number of fails both have to be at least 10. Okay? Um, this is a typo here. I don't know if it shows the same as yours, but these were meant to be steps 1, 2, 3, 4, and 5, not 6, 7, 8, 9, and 10. So these were the five steps that we're going to follow when constructing a confidence interval. And it's the same exact five steps we learned um, in 8.1 and 8.2 talking about a confidence interval for means. The first step is define the parameter you're looking for and state the level of confidence. Well, in this section, what the parameter we're looking for is the population proportion. State the level of confidence. The next step is always state the statistical method you're using. Now for us, for a proportion, all we have is a one proportion z interval. Remember with the means, you had a one sample uh, z interval or a one sample t interval, and that was dependent on whether or not you were using the population standard deviation or the sample standard deviation. Well, for the case of um, proportions, the way we find the standard deviation is just based on p hat and q hat. In other words, these I'm going to find from my sample. I don't have to worry about two options or do I have the um, population standard deviation or not. There's only one test to do and it's this, the one proportion z interval and that's what that is. Okay. Step three is check the requirements, IRL. Again, that way no one can argue with us at the end of the day because we're doing good statistics. Remember, step four is where you actually do the thing. You actually do the interval. And then, again, step five is just state your conclusion. So these are it's exactly the same as what we did in 8.1 and 8.2. The formula just changes slightly because we're not talking about means. We're talking about proportions. And so we, the way we find standard deviation for a proportion is slightly different, again, thanks to what we learned in 7.1 about the central limit theorem. Okay, so um, as far as the feel of these, they're going to feel exactly like what we did in the last sections. Okay, let's try this first example here. Suppose that a market research firm is hired to estimate the percent of adults living in a large city who have cell phones. 500 randomly selected adult residents in the city are surveyed to determine whether they have a cell phone. Of the 500 people that are surveyed, 421 respond yes, they own a cell phone. 
using a 95% confidence level computed confidence interval to estimate the true proportion of adult residents that have a cell phone. So again, I'm going to continue to draw this little silly picture here just to make sure we wrap our heads around what the heck is going on. There's some distribution of adults that have cell phones. There is a true proportion of adults that have cell phones. Some percentage, 80%, 70%. We don't know. We're trying to figure that out. Well, what we did is we took a sample and we found a sample proportion, which is listed here. What did we find? It says that on our survey, out of 500, 421 people said, yes, they have a cell phone. So our sample proportion was 421 out of 500, which if I want to write that as a decimal, 0.842. There is my sample proportion, okay, in this case. Again, I drew it above the actual proportion. I don't know if that's true or not, but what we're going to do, just like with means, we're going to say, okay, let's start there. Let's go some standard deviations right. Let's go some standard deviations left and make a window. And then we will feel pretty darn good that that window contains the actual true percentage of people uh, or adult residents that own a cell phone. Okay, so that's our starting point. Um, let's just start with the process. Remember, step one is state what you're looking for and at what level of confidence. So we want the true proportion or percentage, however you want to say it, because again, the proportion is just a fraction, which can be written as a decimal and a percent. But we want the true proportion of adults in the city that own a cell phone. Um, at a 95% confidence level. Okay, step one is clearly state what you want and at what confidence level. Step two is state the method you're going to use. Now, technically now we have three confidence interval methods. We have one sample Z intervals, one sample T intervals, and one proportion Z intervals. Remember, the one sample Z and one sample T intervals are used for finding the mean. Okay, the one proportion Z interval is used for finding a proportion. All right, so what I'm going to use here is the one proportion Z interval. All right, three is check that we're doing good statistics. Check IRL. Are we independent? Are we randomly sampling? And are we large enough? Okay. Well, independent. Um, again, I think there's a chance it's not. If if uh, you know if all your if all your adult friends have a cell phone and you don't, you may be more inclined to get one. So there could be some sort of um, influence based on one adult to the next. However, the 5% rule works here. They say that this is a large city. So if this is a large city, and we're only talking to 500 adults in that city, chances are really good that 500 is less than 5% of the total population of the city. So we could say it's safe to assume 500 is less than 5% of the city population. Thus, we can treat as independent. So again, whether or not it is independent, we're not going to get too upset about it. 
mathematically we could just pretend it is and uh, the numbers will be close enough okay was random sampling used yeah here I see that 500 randomly selected adults so again they don't have to elaborate on what the process is we just have to know that it was random process so yes a random process was used Okay, and are we large enough? Now, to be large enough, I need to take n times p hat, I guess technically, for my sample. I sampled 500 people, and 0.842 of them said they have a cell phone. Now, actually, I didn't need to do it this way, but let me just write it out. This would come out to 421, and I know that because 421 people said, yes, they have a cell phone. So it may not be the case that you actually have to multiply these. It may be in the problem that there's the number of successes you had, 421. But this would be the number of successes. So um, the number of success is greater than or equal to 10. So we're good. The number of fails, that would be n times q which would be 500 times, if this is P, Q is the complement, so it's 1 minus that, you know, roughly, uh, what, 16% or so. I could multiply those, but I could also just say that, okay, well, if out of 500, if 421 said, uh, yes, I have a cell phone, then that means uh, 79 said, no, I do not have a cell phone in which case the number of fails is also greater than 10. So yes, we are large enough. Large enough for p hats, the distribution of p hats to be normal. Well, approximately normal. All right, so now we're doing good statistics. Step four is where you actually find the confidence interval. And remember, for our case, it, I mean, it's still the same format. You start with your estimate, your point estimate, which there it is. And then you're going to add and subtract your margin of error, which is always your critical number, in this case a z-score, times the standard deviation of your distribution here which we found this or we find the standard deviation this way for proportions again that's according to what we learned in chapter 7 1 so if it helps I could just come off to the side and remind ourselves of some of these p hat was 0 0.842 so q hat would be 1 minus that thing which is um, 0 0.157 now my critical z-score um, again you're gonna start to remember these because 95% is a very common one and it's actually 1.96 is the critical z-score you would use what you would do on a z-table though is again you're trying to block off 95% that means these two arms make up 5% or two and a half percent each and so if you consult this table the z table and look for an area of 0 0.25 you're going to get a z score of negative 1.96 from your table again we always take the positive value for our critical z value so i've got everything i need to just plug and chug into here because again i also i know that n the sample size was 500. so I get my point estimate. Plus or minus that critical z score times the square root of p hat 0.842. And this is q hat, which is 0.157, all over 500. Okay. 
And if I put all this into the calculator correctly, all this stuff, my margin of error becomes 0 0.032. So again, what's going on here is I said, well, I think the estimate, my estimate proportion was 0 0.842. 84.2% of the adults that I sampled said they have a cell phone. I'm going to add this much left and right, 0 0.32, to create my window. And I'm going to feel pretty darn confident that the true proportion, uh, the true percentage of all adults in the city that have a cell phone, lives in this window. So if I take my point estimate and add 0 0.32, I'm at uh, 0 0.874. That's this end point here. And if I take my point estimate and I subtract 0 0.32, I would be at 0 0.810. That's this end point here. Okay, and so the very last step is always state your findings. And so we can always just use this same statement. We are 95% confident that the true percentage or proportion, however you want to say it, I guess if you say percentage, then write your answers as percents, of adults in the city that have a cell phone is between 0 0.810 and 0 0.874. Or if I were going to say percentage, I would say it's in between 81% and 87.4% of adults in the city have a cell phone. So again, it's not like we're trying to get the uh, population proportion exactly right. It's really hard to do that. You really can't do that unless you do a census and ask everybody. What we're doing is we're just getting a window that we feel really confident about the answer living in between those two numbers. Okay. This follow-up question says, explain what 95% confidence means in the context of the problem. Well, again, um, some funky distribution. There's a true proportion that we're trying to find. And we found a sample proportion and built an interval around it, right? <clears throat> well, if we do that 100 times, 95 out of those 100 times, we're going to capture it. It does mean that five of those times we won't. So maybe my sample is just way too far out here for some reason. And so when I make my window, my window misses the proportion. Some of them might miss based on how far or how close your sample is to the actual proportion. Okay, But if we were to do this again 90 to, uh, 100 times, take 500 people, ask them how many have a cell phone, find that percentage and build your interval. 95 out of those 100 times we're going to get this guy to land in our window. So that makes us feel pretty darn good that if 95 out of 100 times this works, I feel pretty confident that this answer really does live in between there. That's a very good chance that it's there. Okay. So I hope you agree or feel like, well, that's kind of familiar, and that doesn't feel like anything too new. Because it's not. The whole nature of finding a confidence interval is those same five steps over and over and over again. The only thing that's changed here is we're talking about a proportion, and therefore the way we find standard deviation is a little different. Okay. <clears throat> Let's take a look at this next one. This says, for a class project... A poli sci student at a large university wants to estimate the percentage of students who are registered voters. He surveys 500 students and finds that 300 are registered voters. Compute a 90% confidence interval for the true percent of students who are registered voters 
and interpret the confidence interval. Okay, <clears throat> let's just do our silly little picture again. Some distribution of registered voters. There's a true proportion of people that are actually registered. Um, well, I guess this should be a distribution of students. And there's a true proportion of those students that are registered to vote. We asked 500 students if they're registered to vote, and 300 said they were. So we got an estimate. My estimate is 300 out of 500, which is a uh, 0.6. Okay. So that's going to be my estimate. I'm going to build a window around it, and I'm going to be 90% certain that the true proportion of all the students at the university that are registered to vote lives in that window. Okay. So let's run through our steps. Again, step one, clearly state what you want and what level of confidence. We want to find the true percentage or proportion of students um, that are registered to vote. They say percent, so let's go ahead and just use percent. Find the true percentage that are registered to vote at a 90% confidence level. Alright. Two, we want to state the procedure we're going to use. And again, because we're looking for a proportion, we're trying to build an interval that estimates the population proportion. It's only one option for us. It's a one proportion Z interval. <clears throat> Three, Make sure we're doing good statistics. Check IRL. Are we independent? Random. Large enough. Well, independent. Again, this one may be on its face value. No. If all of your friends are registered to vote at school, then maybe you're more inclined to do it. And so maybe of those 500 people, some are buddies. Maybe not, um, but I think it's. I think again, we can reason our way out by saying that. Well, this is a large university. Um, I mean, at Santa Ana College, we have I think thirty-five thousand students. So a large university has got a lot of people on there. So I think it's safe to say that whether or not they're independent, we can treat it as independent using the five percent rule. So it's safe to assume. that 500 is less than 5% of the student population. Thus, treat as independent. Okay. Um, does it say that we used random sampling somewhere? Um, it doesn't say. So if it doesn't say, we got to assume no. Which is a big bummer because now there is a big opportunity for someone to take our results at the end of the day and say, well, did you randomly sample? Because that could totally have an effect on our results. So, you know, I'm assuming it was a typo left out of the problem, but if it doesn't say, then you got to assume no. We're still going to go through with the problem. And, and this could happen that, um, and it does happen in statistics, that maybe you don't meet some of these requirements. You keep going and you get an answer, but you just kind of have to be a clear with that answer at the end of the day say well here's what we got but we didn't use random sampling so take it for what it's worth okay it doesn't mean it's wrong it just means that is there's opportunity for it to have been biased one way or the other um, are we large enough remember for means 
that means did you sample more than 30? For proportions, that means is the number of success and number of fails bigger than 10? So the number of successes um, which you can always find by taking n times p, right? Uh, the sample size times the percentage that are registered voters. Well, in this case, they told me they got 300 registered voters, so I don't even need to mess with taking, you know, this percent times 500 because that's all I'll get. Well, that's bigger than 10. We're good. The number of fails would be the number of students that uh, are not registered voters. If 60% are voters, right, this is my p hat, then that means q hat the percentage that are not voters would be 40% or 0 0.40. So I could take 500 times 0 0.40, but I could also just reason out that if 300 were registered to vote, then the leftovers, 200, were not registered to vote. Also bigger than 10, so yes, we're big enough. Yes, large enough for the distribution of p hats to be approximately normal. Okay. So again, that's just, step three is always about trying to make sure we're doing good statistics and people can't argue with us at the end of the day. Step four is where you actually do the thing. You find the confidence interval. So again, the general format for a confidence interval for a proportion is the sample proportion and then you're going to add or subtract your margin of error, which is a bunch of standard deviations. Your critical z-score, that tells you how many. And to find the standard deviation of your p-hats, it's the square root of p-hat q-hat over n. Again, according to the central limit theorem. 90% um, confidence interval. Again, this is critical z-score you're probably going to start to memorize soon. Just to remind us, I'll show you how to get it. But if I want to block off the middle 90%, that means these two tails together make up the rest, 10%. That means it's 5% per tail. And I'm only interested in this one because that's how my z-table works. It tells me left scores, or area left of my z-score. So I just need to go to the z-table, find where does the area uh, to the left of that score, 5%. And again, because I am clearly left of the mean, I need to look on the negative z table. So let's do that. I think it's 1.645 if I'm remembering right. Again, you'll start to memorize some of these common ones. So here's the negative z table. Let me put my picture back up here. Um, middle 90 makes this one arm 0 0.05. That's the area I'm looking for. So let's find that area. Remember, z tables put the area in the middle here and the z scores out on the edge. So 0. Um, 0 0.05 is what I need. 0 0.05. It's right in between these two guys. So it's negative 1.6 and it's in between these. So it's in between negative 1.64 and negative 1.65, so again, it's 1.645 would be halfway. Here, maybe? No. Nope. So, my critical z score, well, let's see. The point estimate was 60% or 0 0.60. That was the sample proportion we found. I'm going to add 1.645 standard deviations to that. P hat is 0 0.60, 60%. If it's 60% that are registered, Q hat is the percentage that are non registered. That would be 40% and divided by the square root of your sample size, 500. So this gives me 0 0.60 plus or minus. Um, if I multiply all this stuff right, what I got is 0 0.036, if I put it in the calculator right. 
And so when I add and subtract that margin of error to my point estimate, I get the interval 0 0.564 to 0 0.636. All right, and then the last thing is state your conclusion. So we are 90% confident that the true percentage of students that are registered to vote is between 56.4% and 63.6%. You can leave them as decimals, but then don't use the word percentage. Use the word proportion. If I'm going to use the word percentage, I should write my answer as a percentage. But that's it. That's the percentage of students that we think are registered to vote at the university. And we're 90% certain that we captured the answer. Right? Again, if we did this process a hundred times, 90 of them we're going to get it, 10 of them we won't. So we feel pretty good that the true answer is there. Okay. Those are the only examples we're going to do as far as the whole five-step process making the confidence interval. All that's left is some questions about margin of error. Um, and then at the very end, they give us um, another formula to help us determine the sample size we would need to use given a particular margin of error we're okay with. So let's take a look at these problems here. It says that um, a local poll samples 500 likely voters and finds that 74% support Proposition Q on the next ballot. What is the margin of error in this poll if they want to be 90% confident in their estimate? Okay, let's just remind ourselves of the general form of a confidence interval or a proportion. It's your point estimate plus your margin of error, which is this guy times the square root of p hat q hat over n, right? That is your margin of error. It's always the amount that you're adding and subtracting from your estimate of the population value. So they're saying what's the margin of error? Well if I can figure out what z star is, what p hat is, what q hat is, and what n is, I'm just gonna plug it into the formula and let the calculator do the work. Well, for 90% confidence interval, we just found that critical Z value. In fact, that's it right there. Give myself a little more room. Um, P hat is the probability or the pr proportion or percentage of success. So they said 74% support the proposition. So p hat would be 0 0.74 and if 74 percent support the proposition then that means the complement or the flip side of the coin 26 percent do not that would be q hat okay. again remember q hat is always 1 minus p hat and n the sample size is 500 so i'm just going to use that my error is equal to this z star square root of p hat q hat over n so it would be 1.645 times the square root of 0.74 times 0.26 all over 500 that comes out to um, 0 0.032 very close to what that last one was. Okay, anyways, that's the margin of error. 
again, this problem didn't want us to do a whole confidence interval. They just wanted us to calculate this part, the margin of error, for this given scenario. Okay, let's take a look at B. It says that the school surveys a group of oh, I'm sorry, the school surveys a group of students, and it must be and estimates that somewhere between 58% and 64% of students want to have more food options on campus. What was the point estimate and what was the margin of error? So in here they're actually giving you um, like the interval, the confidence interval. So they're telling me the end result. They're saying that the interval they came up with is 58% and 64%. Well, the point estimate must have been right in the middle, right? Isn't the estimate right in the middle? And from there you go left and right, your margin of error. So all I need to do is find what's in the middle of those two numbers. Um, one way to find the middle of two numbers is to find their midpoint, which is average them. So um, p hat would be the average of those two percentages. 0.58 plus 0.64 over 2, right? which would be 0 0.61, I believe, should be right in the middle. Okay, so the point estimate From their sample, they had 61% of students said they want more food options. Okay. The margin of error is just the distance from 61% up to the 64% or down to the 58%. I could just do some subtraction and see that that's 3%. Again, I just got that by taking uh, by subtracting these guys. This was just, you know, 64% minus the estimate of 61%. Okay. So just having us think about what this interval looks like and margin of error and things like that. Lastly, this one says the school surveys a group of students and is 95% confident that 0.284 to 0.289 contains the actual proportion of math students who use the math center regularly. What was the point estimate and what was the margin of error? Same question. They're giving me the interval. Right Here they kind of maybe are trying to throw us off by telling us the level of confidence, but I don't think we need that. If you tell me the interval, it has a low of 0.284 or 28.4% and a high of 0.298 or 29.8%. That's my entire interval. So the point estimate, when they sampled and they got an estimate from that sample of the percentage of uh, students that use the math center, it's got to be halfway in between those. So again, what I could do is just find the midpoint or the halfway mark between those. Add them up and divide by 2. Um, and if I do that right, I think I get 0 0.291. That would be the point estimate, or what they found when they surveyed however many students they surveyed. And again, if I want the margin of error, well, I could just find that distance there. I could subtract, so the error I could just take 0 0.298 minus 0 0.291, um, and that's um, 0 0.007. That would be my margin of error, or a lot of times they just use E for error. All right. Okay, on the next page, the last thing to cover is um, formula talking about given a certain amount of error we're okay with, what sample size should I use before I do my experiment? Okay, we'll look at that next. Okay, so let's look at the next page. Um, if you recall, here is our margin of error. Right, again, 
for our confidence interval, it's the point estimate plus or minus the margin of error. Now, um, just like we talked about in the last section, um, before we do an experiment, we may have a particular amount of error that we are okay with, and we may not want to go above that. Or basically, we want to may have a certain amount of accuracy to our interval, um, which would be the amount of error we are okay with. So we want to be able to determine what sample size I should use in order to get that error. Again, n, you see, does impact the error because it's in the denominator of this fraction, which makes, therefore, the, the larger n gets, the smaller this whole number gets, and therefore the smaller the error gets. So larger sample size, smaller error. So if you have a predetermined amount of error that you're okay with, you can then figure out what sample size should you use in order to achieve that amount of error. Okay. Well, we're going to do exactly what we did in chapter 8.2. We're going to take this formula for the error, the margin of error, and I'm going to solve this thing for n. I'm just going to get n all by itself. All right. And so um, I'm going to start by recognizing that um, when you have a square root of a fraction here, that one thing I'm allowed to do is to break it into a fraction of the square roots. So I could break it into two square roots. The reason I'm going to do that is that's going to help me to get that n out of the denominator. I'm going to multiply both sides by n, or radical n, so that on the right they cancel. And I get square root of n times e is equal to my critical z-score times the square root of p and q. Okay. Now, you notice up here I wrote the sample proportion, right? Sample p or p hat and q hat. And here they're just using p and q. They're using the population values, um, the population proportion. Well, again, remember, this is all going to take place before in a a sample is drawn or before an experiment takes place. I'm first trying to figure out what sample size should I use. So no sample has taken place, meaning I don't have a sample proportion. So I either need to know the population proportion or we'll read this little part down here when we're done. I just wanted to point out why we don't have the little hats here. We are talking about uh, population values because again the sampling hasn't taken place yet so we don't know what the sample proportion is. Okay, I'm still working on getting n by itself so I'm gonna take this and I'm gonna divide both sides by e. Let's move it to the other side there. So then I get on the left just the square root of n and on the right I've got the critical z value, I've got the square root of pq, and I've got e in the bottom. And like I did with the last one, to get n all by itself, I'm going to square both sides to undo that square root. So I get n uh, equals, and uh, well, let's just think about this for a second. This would be, um, if I have, well first of all, this square is going to undo this square root, and it's going to square these two things. So I'm going to end up with z star over e those two things need to be squared and then I've got radical pq squared and you know this square and that square root are gonna wipe each other out so the value of n my sample size whoops needs to be needs to be at least this big remember you can always go bigger so they always say round up if needed so n should equal this number or be more than this number it should be greater than or equal to z star over e squared like a star, times p q. Okay. So whatever error you have in mind or you're okay with, this formula will tell you the uh, sample size that should be used in order to achieve that amount of error. Okay. And again, that's based on the population proportion, 
um, or the number of successes and the number of fails, or it's not the number, the percentage of successes and percentage of fails. Um, now, a lot of times we won't know what that is. So if you don't know what the population proportion is, like you don't know what percentage of the adult population owns a cell phone or registers as Democrat or whatever it is, the best we can do is to split them down the middle and call them both 50-50, 50%. So if no information is known about the population proportion, simply call it 50%, and that makes Q 50% because they're complements, which means this formula that we just figured out would break down to this, 0.5 times 0.5. Um, so if you multiply those together, you get 0.25. So 0.25, I'll just put it up front, Z star over E. Oh wait, and this should be squared. These should be squared. So if you don't know anything about the population proportion, then that's the formula you use. You assume that P and Q are both 50%. Alright, so let's look at this last problem here. Suppose a mobile phone company wants to determine the current percentage of customers age 50 or above who use text messaging on their cell phones. How many customers age 50 or above should the company survey in order to be 90% confident that the estimated proportion is within 3 percentage points of the true population proportion um, of those customers age 50 and over? Okay, so again... Um, there's some funky distribution. We are we're aiming for the real proportion of adults over 50 that text. Okay, and what they're saying is that um, they're fine constructing a window, but they don't want that window to exceed three percent above or below the true proportion. So this is just going to be three percent above and three percent below. That's the margin of error that they are okay with. Right, so we have our error at 3% or 0.03. My critical Z score, now let's see, they say I've got a 90% confidence level. Um, by now, maybe we're starting to memorize some of these. I think with um, for 90% confidence level, the Z score would be 1.645. Um, what else do I have? I Now, so my formula... I'm looking back, I've got to use one of these two formulas. If I know the percentage of the population that um, uh, text, the percentage of folks over 50 that text, then I would know P and then I would also know Q, it's complement. But I don't know that. Right? So the best thing we can do is we can only assume that they're each 50%. That's the best we can do, you know, without giving favor to one or the other. So really what's going to be needed is I'm going to have to use this formula here. The sample size I should take should be a 0 0.25 times that critical z-score over the error I'm okay with squared because they don't help, help me or tell me what the population percentage is that text. So let's just plug in these numbers and see how many people they need to sample. This is 1.645 E was 0 0.03. That comes out to 751.67. Well, they can't survey 751.67 adults, right? So they must sample um, 752, let's say at least. 752 um, customers age 50 or above um, to get the um, to have basically uh, the amount of error they're okay with Okay. Well, that's, I think, the, yeah, that's the end of it for chapter eight.
So again, I'm, I'm really hoping that um, after 8.1 and 8.2, that 8.3 felt incredibly similar and incredibly familiar and routine. And if it's not, I guarantee the homework is going to, because the homework is going to ask you to do a lot of confidence intervals, and you're just going to run through those five steps every time. Whether it's a mean or proportion, it's the same five steps. The only thing that changes is, um, you know, the nature of your confidence interval, basically the nature of how you find standard deviation. Okay, that's what's different between mean and proportions. But otherwise, we're doing the same thing over and over and over. Okay, hope this went all right from you, and hope you guys are doing well, and we'll see you soon.